You know, it's been several years now since we were in our studies in Matthew 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Not all of you that are here this morning were here then, but a good number of you were. And we're on again this morning the message, the truth of discipleship. And uh, I just thought I would go back and look and see what we'd said way back then, which has been a number of years ago. And so I went back to what was evidently the first or the second message. I can't ever tell the way I've got things set up. But uh, we were talking then about the deeper life in the Spirit. And remember the crucified life, the path of discipleship, the deeper life in the Spirit are all the same thing. They're just different terms for the same experience that a Christian is to be having. And so it's interesting to see what we'd said back then is exactly the same that we're saying right now. It's just that, well, you understand a lot more now. You're a little deeper yourself. I mean, deeper life in the Spirit. Who wants to study deeper life when you're not deeper? Well, that's what's supposed to make you deeper, is the deeper life in the Spirit. So if you're not deeper, uh, as long as you haven't been here over a week, then that's okay. So we were showing you what the deeper life in the Spirit was not. And I just found it to be very interesting because we continually are saying the same thing time and time again. So it's not just an aside, it's part of what we're studying, studying again this morning. What the deeper life in the Spirit was not, we said it was not the acceptance of the full gospel message. Because, you know, all charismatics are excited about the experience they have, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when they get there in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, this must be the deeper life in the Spirit. It's a lot deeper, or it's supposed to be anyway, than denominationalism, but that's not the deeper life in the Spirit. Right. We said that there was a difference between being in a spiritual realm and being in the realm of the Spirit. Being in a spiritual realm is whenever you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That puts you into a new and living spiritual realm uh, a part of which you've never been before. That is, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that's just the spiritual realm, the realm of the Spirit, capital S. Not as some people are wanting to make all the spirits, make them all small in the Bible. Capital S, the realm of the Spirit, is the deeper life in the Spirit, where you're living not just in a spiritual realm, because even the occult practicer lives and walks in a spiritual realm. It's just the wrong spiritual realm. Amen. It's a spiritual realm. It's a very real one. And because the church has no supernatural aspect to it today, that's why a lot have turned to the occult, Eastern religions, false religious cults that have been springing up just by the boatload, right in this country, right in this century, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I had a philosophy teacher in college I still have my, my textbooks from the class I remember, and we were studying religion in the philosophical sense. We raised questions like, how can you solve the problem of man's free will versus predestination when the Bible appears to teach both? And religious experience and mystics and, and faith and divine healing, this was all studied and taught. And then the last thing we got to was the subject of miracles. And about her, it was a she, about her last statement in that whole class that we had in philosophy of religion was one way we can prove that the church today is not valid is because it's basing its life upon the Bible. And the Bible, anyone can tell by just opening it and reading it, is a supernatural book. She recognized that. She said, I don't believe in Christianity because if the church today is the church of the Bible, then where's the miracles of the Bible? Amen. And I just told her, come to our church then. <laughs> Don't go to the church of this world or the church of this country. Come to ours and we'll see the miracles. Yeah, she was wise enough to see that if the church today is based on the church of the Bible, then there's no similarity. Because the church of the book of Acts was a church filled with miracles. They trusted God. They saw healings. They saw demons cast out. And the church of the world doesn't even believe in demons. They call it psychological aberrations that one has, rather than demonic personalities that one is possessed by. Amen. So it's not just the acceptance of the full gospel message where a person receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, 
There's been untold millions now across the world today who've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit back in the 60s or 70s, whenever there was a great outpouring, and have never grown since then. Mm -hmm. Now that's proof something's wrong with them. Right. Something's wrong in their life. They might be in a spiritual realm, but they're not in the realm of the Spirit, though. Mm -hmm. If they're in the realm of the Spirit, he's taking them somewhere. He's doing something in them. They're growing in their life. And that was one thing I saw missing and why I kept crying out, Lord, do a deeper work Amen. in my life. And it was that cry that got me saved and got me baptized and put me further than that. I wasn't content just settling for, well, at least I have the Holy Spirit. And that's more than most people have because a whole lot of people are getting the Holy Spirit today and speaking in tongues. And so I made notations in my diary, Lord, take us deeper. There has to be something beyond Pentecost. I mean, Acts 2 is not anywhere near the end of the Bible or the New Testament. There must be something beyond Pentecost. As blessed as it was, and we still feel it's blessed. Some of us have had the Holy Spirit for many, many years now. And we're still talking in tongues and talking about talking in tongues. Uh, we never have lost the excitement about it. But... We have to talk about other things as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to come back to our first love and come back to basics, but we have to go on at the same time. Can you do both? Well, sure, that's what we do all the time. We come back to the basics and then we go on. Praise God. So the deeper life in the Spirit is not just the acceptance of the full gospel message. By that we mean the baptism. It begins with that. You'll never get into the deeper life of the Spirit until you get the Spirit, that's for sure. We said that the deeper life in the spirit was not increased religious activity. You see, these were perceptions that we had gleaned from our experiences in denominational Christianity and charismatic Christianity as well. And these are just things you pick up, that people equate spirituality with increased religious activity. Where, if anything, it is a yielding and a slowing down. But it's the typically accepted thing that if you are, and it's just habitual with most Christians, it's a habit, that if you're spiritual, then you're busy. And so to get really deeper life in the spirit means you just, you give up things at home, you start washing dishes after the church supper, you pick up cigarette butts on the church ground, you get busy because no one wants to do that. Unless you're deeper life in the spirit, that's what they would say, deeper life, I pick up cigarette butts around my church. And they curse and swear when they get home about having to do it. <laughs> and then say, now this is really the deeper life while they're there. Or they get up there in the choir loft where the pigeons sit and uh, begin to yodel up there. And it's a little warmer up there like it is here as compared to out there. And so they say, that's deeper life. I'm crucifying self by getting out of my pew. We're down way here in basement level. It's cool getting up there in the pigeons loft and yodeling for a while. That's deeper life in the Spirit. Increase my activity, and it'll increase my desire for more activity. And it does, as well as increase their spirituality. The deeper life in the Spirit, thirdly, we said was not to be equated with great supernatural manifestations mm -hmm. in one's life. The deeper life and the supernatural life are two different things. Because God will even honor his holy word proclaimed by an unholy man. Amen. And so that's not deeper life, mm -hmm. but it's supernatural life. Mm -hmm. They can have the supernatural. Now, we believe in the supernatural, but just because a person is running around saying miracles does not, listen to me, does not mean that he is really in the center of the will of God. Right. He may be, he may not be. Mm -hmm. The odds are he's probably not if he's not situated and located somewhere to learn the Word of God. And we've had all of these great past evangelists and self-professing apostles and prophets that saw all types of works, and I just have to leave them right where they were. So what if they saw great miracles, great supernatural acts? Mm -hmm. My wife and I were talking just the other night about one of the famous who's now dead charismatic women evangelists and she was asking the question you know can we really say that all of her miracles were the works of Satan I said no I wouldn't say that 
unless you're for certain because you might blaspheme the Holy Spirit to attribute the works of the Holy Spirit to an unclean spirit. I see, I wouldn't say that all of their works were done by the power of Satan, but I'll say she was out of the will of God because God does not anoint women to be evangelists. There's no verses for that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, there are verses against that in the New Amen. Testament. So, and people just wonder about that. You know, that's why a lot of the people now in the women's movement can't give up their unscriptural notion of women preachers. It's because of what about so-and-so? And they named so-and-so that saw great miracles. And I say, just let the miracles be. But what about them in their relationship to the commandments and precepts of the Word of God? Let the miracles be what they were. And if they were miracles and God anointed the holy word of an unholy individual, then praise the Lord. He did that in the Old Testament. But that doesn't mean that that person's in the center of God's will. Now, that is a simple statement that we all accept around here, but it's just profound to most people. It's just profound. They say, why, mm -hmm. they've raised the dead. Mm -hmm. And they mean by that God's pleased with them. That, that means that they are God's servant of this hour. And we just take that to be accepted that it doesn't mean anything near that. Mm -hmm. They might have seen a miracle, but might not be in the will of God. And so on the positive side, we went on to say that the deeper life in the spirit is. And we gave you several things. And you just compare this to the last few years and what we're still studying now. You see... Back those several years ago, whenever those of you that were there, that are here now, were sitting there in the building, listening to that message, you'd probably never dream where you'd be right now. Amen. <laughs> but listen to what we're saying. We're covering all the things. We gave you a warning right then. Amen. <laughs> we said that the deeper life was submitting to the inner work of the Holy Spirit. Rather than, rather than trying to concentrate the reformation of the outer man. Try to get someone to wear the right clothes or quit smoking or take off their glasses or quit dancing or quit going to movies. No, it begins with a submitting to the inner work of the Holy Spirit rather than trying to reform the outer man by means of America's social gospel. We said it's a surrendering of our will for God's will. It's saying maybe, well, Lord, I would rather do this than that, but then don't put a period, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. To have as your heart's cry the cry of your Lord. I might rather do this than that, but it's not what I would rather do. It's what you would rather me do. It's a surrendering of our will to God. We said in the third place, it is the crucifixion. You probably never even heard terms like that except whenever someone was preaching about Jesus. <laughs> you didn't know we were talking about you. It is the crucifixion or the death of the self-life. Last week, Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world was crucified unto me and I unto the world. Crucifixion, self-crucifixion, not just a sermon on Christ's atonement. Then fourthly, we said it's living the spirit-led life and not just the spirit-filled life. We said there'd be new terms or phrases that we'd be getting into in almost 50 tapes on the Sermon on the Mount, such as the following. And now these just become, have become part of your vocabulary. The deeper life in the spirit, the crucified life, the fullness of God, the death of the self-life, the message of total discipleship. Now, can you believe all that was back in the very first message of the charismatic school? The very first one. The message of discipleship, death of self-life, crucifixion, deeper life, fullness of God. We're teaching the same things now. Amen. It's just that, as I said earlier, you now have a deeper understanding of the deeper life. Amen. And we want to even look more this morning at the deeper life by taking a deeper look at the deeper life. You see, the church of, of our day has lost the, the true meaning of discipleship. They've lost the true meaning of discipleship. They don't know that to be a disciple means to be a follower of Jesus. They think to be a disciple, if they ever use the term, which they don't, means to be an attender at your local average favorite church of your choice. You know, I'm a little amused by these radio broadcasts that come over for 15 minutes. Well, let's, 
let's backtrack a little. They asked for money for five and then preach for five and then asked for money for five again. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, they say now, dear friend, dear radio partner, dear faith partner out there in Radio Land, won't you this weekend attend the church of your choice? I mean, just pick one. They're all in the yellow pages. <laughs> Have you looked? We're not in there. <laughs> we don't advertise ourselves in the yellow pages. We don't advertise ourselves by anything. How unscriptural can you get and how much like the world can you get? That's a directory for the world's religion. They want to sell you this or sell you that. And they want to sell you their church. But it's amusing when you hear them say, dear friend, won't you attend the church of your choice? And, they, and what they mean by that is just pick one out. Whichever one is your choice, does it matter? It doesn't matter. God loves the Nazarenes like he loves the Baptists. Just take the church. <laughs> yeah, he loves them the same. <laughs> Which is not at all. Hallelujah. No, the deeper life in the spirit, a deeper look at the deeper life, means that we have to go deeper than nominal institutional religion of our day. I mean, we're always preaching about it, and so we just preach about it again this morning. The deeper life in the spirit is going, is going deeper. I mean, if it's the deeper life, then you have to compare yourself to something else. Because to go deeper than means someone else is not as deep as you, right? And people are criticizing us for being critical of others. And that's the way it works, too. You shouldn't be so critical, then why are you criticizing us for being critical? You end up being critical yourself. The Holy Spirit will give you so much light and understanding that you can just bowl your critics over. He doesn't always allow you to do that, though, does he? No, sometimes a deeper life, you just don't say anything and just smile. You know you've got the truth, but there's no sense in trying to justify yourself. Or if they ask for it, tell them. Some of them will. But if they don't, you don't want to tell them and then go home and just think about the great wisdom I manifested toward that individual. I was so wise they couldn't even answer whenever I finished my exposition. I must be like Jesus. You know, <laughs> the scribes and Pharisees had no answer for his wisdom. No, the deeper life in the spirit is not going home and thinking thoughts like that. You know, you'd like to just tell them where they're wrong. You know, they come at you with this theology that's just full of holes like a fishnet. And you can see them all, and you'd like just to point out all those holes, and then they're just left there stunned at your wisdom and knowledge of the Word. It generally doesn't happen that way, but those who aren't walking in the deeper life would like it to happen that way and just go home, push the chair back behind the desk, and just sit there and smile. <laughs> now, if you're laughing, it's because you've done that before. I include myself in there as well. We have to be honest. We have to be honest. <laughs> See, you know because you've done it. You've tilted the chair back and just smiled at yourself. <laughs> because you knew how wise you were to that individual. You just left them um, grasping for words at your wisdom and at your knowledge of the Word of God. You thought you were getting like Jesus. Well, the call is to go deeper than nominal institutional religion. Amen. The type of religion that's described over in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. The type of religion that has the form of godliness but denies the power thereof. They have the form of godliness. Oh, the church of today, the church of America, the church of this world, they go through the liturgical forms. They go through the creedal doctrines of their institutional forefathers. But they have no power to implement the teachings of Christ. Amen. They have a form of godliness, but they lack the power thereof. Amen. They have a form of godliness. They go through the liturgical forms and creedal doctrines of their fathers. And yet they have no power to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. And as a result, we end up with a whole church full of impotent Christians. Old spiritual impotency is a worldwide malady that's on the rise today. And not even the church psychologist can cure it. Only the Holy Spirit can. Because he's the only one who can give you the power to put into practice your liturgy and your forms of doctrine. What a miserable experience it must be. And I was raised in institutional religion for 15 years, so I know of what I speak. Mm -hmm. To go through the forms of the liturgy 
week after week after week and have no meaning at all. That's not deeper life in the spirit. That's not any life. That's death. To go through the forms of the liturgy and it, you have no comprehension of what you're doing. It has no meaning to you except in some mystical sense that you equate your religious activity and busyness with being pleasing to God. And you see, that's why God only saves the honest people because it's only the honest ones who'll say to themselves, I'm being deceived here or I'm deceiving myself. It's really both things. I'm allowing others and then I'm doing it myself because I'm allowing them to deceive me into thinking that this is acceptable Christianity. That's not acceptable Christianity. And only the ones who are honest, and it's not anything of their own power, he's the one who makes you honest and just face the facts in your life because he begins to make you feel miserable. That's how I felt. I began to see that what I was being taught was not of God. What I was practicing could not be found in the Word of God. And although occasionally someone might see that, then they close their eyes to the truth of the Word of God. They close their eyes, and when you try to present it to them, they close their eyes to it. That's not being honest. And worse than that, they then try to hold back the truth from anyone else seeing it. Uh, this is set forth over in Romans chapter 1. In verse 18, those people against whom the wrath of God is manifested, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold back the truth in unrighteousness just as the Egyptians held back Israel and continued to try to hold her back, so the church today holds back righteousness and holds back the truth of the Word of God. And we end up with our popular dilemma of starved sheep and overfed shepherds. Because those that are responsible to minister to the people are holding back spiritual sustenance from them. But they've got this form of godliness set Paul has reference to in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, if you want to turn back there. And so what should we do about those people? Well, the same verse informs us. I wonder if you've noticed this before. 2 Timothy 3, 5, the same verse informs us what we should do concerning these people. This is institutional religion of today, having a form of godliness. They have ungodly pictures of Christ in their church. They have crosses, they have steeples, they have a church and pews and hymn books and maybe a Bible occasionally. They have the form of godliness. But denying the power thereof from such, go in and try to convert them, stay in your denominational church once you get the baptism, from such, turn away. That's how plain it is. I mean, that's just, what, four words there, from such, turn away but it answers the turmoil of most charismatics when they're wondering now, does God want me to stay in my church or not? Am I really supposed to stay here or leave? Here's the answer to that turmoil. From such, turn away. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Do you realize that the institutional church in America today is an anti-Christ system. And furthermore, not only are they anti-Christ, Christ Christ is anti-them. It's an anti-Christ church and he's an anti-them God because they don't believe in him and he doesn't believe in them. Matthew 7, let's go over and look at it. That's right. He doesn't believe in them. We got a a letter recently, several days or whenever ago, from, well, let's just say a relative on the other side of the family. And they're trying to persuade us of the truth of their church. It even happened to be a charismatic one. They had a new pastor, just hired a new pastor. <laughs> and you know, whenever you hire a new pastor, he brings in with him new incentives, uh-huh. which by that they mean new programs. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and new things to get everyone excited about. And he had his little spill in there about what this church is going to do for the glory of God. And 
And right there in the very first sentence, he said, our church is an interdenominational church. And this relative had that circled and had a little arrow drawn over there to it and said, now, what's really wrong with that? Where does our church differ from your church? And so they asked for it. You know, if the actors, like I said, if they want to know, then you can tell them. So I didn't write them. I let my wife write them back. And I said, here's the difference. Your church professes to be an interdenominational one. We're an anti-denominational one. <laughs> she had the word circle. So I told her what we thought about the word interdenominational. I mean, not even non-denominational is strong enough in this hour in which we live just to be yeah. non-denominational. You have to go as strong as the Lord allows. And it's anti denominational yeah. so we told them they said where does our church differ we're interdenominational we said we're anti-denominational that's where we differ not everyone that saith unto me matthew 7 21 lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven not everyone who just calls the name of jesus or who goes to church not everyone who has the form of godliness that's a godly form to be saying lord lord not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Right. You have to do the will of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Mm -hmm. Antichrist system, anti them God. Mm -hmm. Matthew 7, 23, I'll profess, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Why? Because they're doing a few religious deeds in verse 22, and they have the name of Jesus on their lips, verse 21. But they're not doing the all-encompassing important thing, and that's the will of God in the end of verse 21. Only those who are doing the will of my Father, which is in heaven, will be guaranteed entrance into heaven. Because heaven is a place of righteousness, not of unrighteousness, a place of love. That's, where, that's why he says, only those who do the will of my Father, who's in heaven. You have to be as those in heaven. That means you have to be doing the will of God, if you ever hope to get into heaven. So the deeper life is going deeper than nominal institutional religion. And at the same time, we have to keep on saying this to get beyond denominations. It's going beyond the superficial charismania that we see in the religious world today. Amen. Nominal institutional religion is not a whole lot worse, if any, than superficial charismania. They're in the same chapter, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7 ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth right. yeah. ever learning never able to come to the knowledge of the truth i was looking in a certain ministry's mail out here this past week where they were soliciting disciples for deception for the fall term of their bible school <laughs> well we taught a message before on bible schools Amen. we should have called it soliciting disciples for deception because that's what it is it's soliciting disciples for deception but anyway they were telling us what uh, areas of of major you could have there you know what areas of study that they had and they had eight areas and so you'd think, well, five of them be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Guess what? Only three of them were that. Evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now that's eight minus three equals five. Five other things. What were they? Everything from clowns to youth workers to people who swept the church floor to people who sang in the choir. Mm -hmm. will train you in these areas of ministry. Now where is that in the word of God? Missions, music, intramural sports, they had it all in their eight areas of study and major. And only three of them were valid. And you can't train someone to be a pastor, evangelist, teacher anyway. So even those three aren't valid. You're either called or you're not called. And they give you the little caption with the sun setting, you know, do you desire a deeper work of God in your life? <laughs> Do you feel called to fivefold, sixfold? For them, it was eightfold ministry. 
And they say, men and women, you're all invited to be solicited for a disciple of deception. And that's what you end up at. Yeah. And so they go and do what? Second Timothy 3, 7, they learn and they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Isn't it a blessing to learn, but then get somewhere after you learn? Amen. Not just learn and learn, and you don't even know how to put anything together. Right. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, that's the most important thing. That right. means your salvation there. Amen. John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth. John 8, it's the truth that will set you free. Amen. Amen. And they just learn and learn and are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if you tell them that you know what the truth is, they'll tell you that's your opinion. That's right. They'll tell you, well, that's your opinion about that. And you tell them this is what the truth is. Amen. You know, the University of Mississippi just recently hired a new chancellor, a young Church of Christ individual who doesn't believe in smoking, dancing, or drinking. And the article said people at Ole Miss believe in all three. And I believe it because I was there. But they interviewed one of my former history professors there, and he said about the selection of this Church of Christ chancellor for a major university, you know, what his opinion was. And he said, my problem with this is the dilemma of an institution of higher learning, emphasizing an institution of higher learning, would hire someone who already has accepted and already believes he knows what truth is. You know, in other words, we're all grasping for truth today. And especially at a university. My problem is this man already thinks he knows what the truth is. And the fellow who said that, my former history professor, is also a former Southern Baptist pastor who began to think so much he thought himself right out of the gospel and the ministry and probably salvation as well. Well, I know because I sat in on many of his lectures. Well, if someone like that thinks they know the truth and they don't, then how much more should we? That is a 38-year-old Church of Christ new chancellor at Ole Miss. And go ahead and tell someone now the truth. The truth is, you know, they, you talk about it, you say, well, the truth is. And you say the truth is God doesn't use doctors. God only uses your faith and the promises of God. Amen. And they'll say that's your interpretation. And yet they can't give you a verse for their deception. And you've got many for your interpretation. They have none for their deception. And yet they'll say, now, that's your interpretation. When all you're saying, after talking about it, now let's settle things. The truth of the matter is this, that God only uses your faith in the promises of God. The blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.24, Isaiah 53, Matthew 8, Acts 10, Job 42, and on and on and on. He uses your faith in the promises of God. Now, why do we say that? It's because superficial charismania doesn't even believe in divine healing. Oh, they've got a doctrine of it. They talk about divine healing. But yet, they pray for God to guide the surgeon's arm and hand and fingers while you're on the operating table. Now, where is the verse for that in the New Testament? Where Luke says, now, Almighty God, instead of let Paul heal the sick, let's hire a surgeon and pray for God to anoint him and guide his hand skillfully. No, Luke didn't carry his black bag around the book of Acts. And he was the one who traveled around with Paul in the book of Acts and then ended up writing it. And then he always recorded supernatural healing. Not even a hint. You know, they even looked through the pages just to find a hint of medical science and of God being in favor of it. Not even a hint. Whenever medical science is mentioned, Second Chronicles chapter 16, it's always in a negative connotation. Asa was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physician. Two years later, Asa died. Now that's a sad commentary, but it's a realistic one on medical science. You only last so long under the surgeon's knife. When God promises you restoration, the church promises you mutilation under the knife of the skilled Southern Baptist surgeon. That's superficial charismania. That's soliciting disciples for deception. When you tell them, come to our place because we have the spirit of truth, that's what the Holy Spirit is. Mm -hmm. And yet when you tell them truth, they'll say that's your opinion. Right away you can tell that people don't recognize what the Holy Spirit is there for in their life. They think that the Holy Spirit came just to give them the utterance of new tongues. 
And they, they look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit as an end in itself rather than as a means and as a doorway to the end. The deeper life in the Spirit is going deeper than institutional religion and all of its concepts as well as superficial charismania that might still try to cling to your mind. Mm -hmm. It's going deeper than that. It's going deeper than some other point of reference. And here are two of them, institutional religion and charismania. To go deeper means you have a point of reference. Below which you're going, you're going deeper than they are. You see, the best gems don't lay on the top of the ground. You have to dig for them. You can find a lot of mud and sand and rocks on top, but you won't find diamonds and gold and silver. Now, isn't that interesting? You won't find them there. You have to dig for them. And superficial Christians just skim the top of the ground and pick up whatever they get. You know what they get? Rocks, mud, sand. Who wants all of that? You go deeper and you'll find where the gems are, where the precious stones are that are compared to the Word of God anyway in the Old Testament. No, the deeper life is taking a look inside yourself and asking the question, am I satisfied with myself and is God satisfied with where I am? It's not always boasting about the good works that you've done where you think that you're pleasing. It's honestly reflecting inwardly and asking yourself, am I satisfied where I am? Because the deeper life is not just a certain level below which none can go. The word is deeper, deeper, deeper. It's not just the depth, period. It's deeper life in the spirit, not the depth. You keep going. You keep going deeper. So if you ask yourself, am I satisfied with where I am? The answer should always be no. I'm not satisfied with where I am. You see, a person can never be filled with righteousness and God and his word, Matthew 5, 6, until they hunger and thirst after that. A man who's not hungry can't be fed. And a man who's not thirsty cannot be given anything to drink. If he feels like I'm satisfied, I'm full of food and water, then how else could he ever gain anything else? Unless you always stay hungry and thirsty. Psalm chapter 63. And verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Uh, two different words for God, by the way, in the Hebrew, which is trying to get across the point. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. Now, this was a psalm of David. He was, a psalm, he was a psalmist after God's own heart, Acts yeah. chapter 16. But yet he wasn't satisfied. He said, early will I seek thee, that is, early in the morning. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You can see the title to the psalm before verse 1. And you can see where he's getting the comparison. He's out in the old dry wilderness of Judah, fleeing from his enemies. And he can look all around him and see all the barrenness there and then draw a spiritual parallel from that. I'm like this land. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I'm barren. Yet he's in God's will. God's preparing him. God's trying him. God's pruning him for his ministry as being king over Israel. You see, he didn't just get to be king all of a sudden like Saul did, who didn't end up being a very good king. David went through years of fleeing before the murderous hands of Saul and his men, before God finally exalted him to being king. And after there, he fled from Absalom, his own son. Now, that was because of his sin. His fleeing from Saul was not because of any of his sin, though. His fleeing was to prepare him. He had to learn out there to begin to totally trust in God. He'd already gotten a portion of that back when he was just a lad. And we're told this over in 1 Samuel chapter 16, chapter 17, where he knew whenever that lion and that bear came after part of his flock, he said, I grabbed the lion by his beard and smote him on the head. Mm -hmm. He had already learned how to trust in God then, but he's learning more. You see, you might already know how to trust, but there's more to learn about trusting. Amen. There's more to learn about trusting. Amen. I think he knew how. 
You think you'd take on a lion barehanded? He didn't have his sling then. He had it against Goliath, but what's the sling against Goliath? And he went on to take Goliath then in those chapters. But have you taken on a bear barehanded? No, the woman in Yellowstone just last week mauled to death by a grizzly bear. That's a ferocious thing to meet up with a bear or a lion. And David said, I took them on barehanded and slew them because great is the strength of my God. And so that's not all. Now he's older and God's preparing him to be king and he's still learning to trust while he's out there. And he's desiring, verse 1, to have some of those experiences that he had earlier when he was in good favor of those around the tabernacle. And he had his religious experiences there. Verse 2, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. He said, I've seen your power and your glory in the sanctuary. And I desire to be back there where it was required that the Jews be. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. I don't believe he just said verse 4. I believe he did it. Right out in the middle of the wilderness of Judah, lifting up his hands. And wanting to go back to the tabernacle of God, verse 2. But you see, the deeper life in the Spirit is more than just church attendance. Uh, the first message in this series on demands of discipleship, we dealt with church membership versus discipleship, where people equate going to church with being a Christian and being a disciple of Jesus. But if you'll look over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, deeper life in the Spirit is more than just occasional attendance at a religious function. Because if it's done in that manner and under that guise and with that spirit, then you're rebuked of the Lord for it. This is a strong message because God's going to do some rebuking of those as he did the Old Testament Israel. Why does the church think she's any different than Israel when she's falling in the same sins as Israel? Murmuring, complaining, being on fire for God, Acts chapter 2 to begin with, and then falling by the wayside when times get rough. But Isaiah chapter 1, and uh, verse 12. Deeper life is more than just occasional attendance. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? You couldn't even get away with preaching a message like that in church because you'd get a pink slip from the deacon board. <laughs> <laughs> when you told the very ones who hired you, who's required you to come to church? I haven't. God hasn't. Who required this at your hand to tread my courts? Why? Because they're coming in the wrong attitude and with the wrong spirit. But you see, we've taught from Isaiah 1 before. And we've said, just don't come. Because God's not requiring it of you if you can't come in the right spirit and in the right frame of mind. Because that's what he's saying. They're coming with the wrong spirit. They're coming doing religious duty, but their heart's not following God. Not at all. And so we just stayed with the word and said, don't come at all then. If your heart's not following after God. He didn't say, well, if you're not following after God, go ahead and come off your sacrifice and that'll help, you make, help make you feel better. Which is what people say. Come to church even if, you know, you're really down in the blues and the dumps because that's what church is for, to pep everyone else up. That's not what church is for. Church is to learn the word of God and to worship the Lord Jesus. Amen. Not to come in way down and take till the end of the service to get way up. And that's right here in the word of God. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my court? The deeper life in the Spirit is rendering more than just lip service to him. Amen. Saying, Lord, I love you. Matthew 7, 21, Lord, Lord. Saying more than that. Isaiah 1, 15. When ye spread forth your hand, then I will hide mine eyes from you. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament prophets, you know they were not popular in the eyes of the people at all. Amen. Because they told them the truth. Oh, you shouldn't be so critical of people. Well, that's what they said of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the other prophets. They were always criticizing Israel and Judah because of their sins. 
When ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And then over in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, uh, beginning with verse 3. He answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? The church today reads over those passages and just thinks of the Pharisees and Sadducees and doesn't think that they are the contemporary Pharisees and Sadducees. For the continuation of this message,